Well, a couple of weeks ago I said, see you in a couple of weeks. And as you can tell, I'm back. And so welcome back to all of you as well that weren't able to be here last Sunday for Thanksgiving. I know for some of us it was an opportunity to get together with family and enjoy some fellowship and just celebrate the things that we have to be thankful for. Uh, we were able to spend some time with uh, Jonathan and his wife Carmen and their three kids, and the one of whom we prayed for lots, and that was Chloe. And uh, she's the one that had the heart surgery, and they put a patch over a hole in her heart. And to see her bouncing for hours almost on the trampoline and running through the fields with me, yes, I was able to run about 20 yards. Um, so, but to be able to do those things, right? And, and so I hope that your Thanksgiving was filled with lots of reasons to give thanks. But I did want to touch on this theme again uh, by way of uh, a reminder. Some of you have the notes. Uh, they were out in the entryway. If somebody is still needing some, uh, we can get those for you. Does anybody need some sermon notes today? We're good? Okay, great. So um, I have been just overwhelmingly struck by trying to discern what's going on in our country and describe trying to discern what's going on in North America and in Europe and, and all the other nations around, and not so much the COVID controversy, but other things that I think are even that much more critical for us to have a good answer for and to us to look deeply into. So I started with us in the idea that we would take a look at what God has been doing in history. And I joke because I failed history almost through all of high school. Uh, and so the fact that I'm still a history teacher uh, is just another reason that for me to believe that God has a sense of humor. So what we took a look at was how God at first was establishing a people and he established his people through Abraham. And through Abraham, certain things were discovered by Abraham and they're written for us in the book of Genesis as Abraham and his family experienced God. And they experienced God in a way that no other people had ever had an opportunity to experience. And God revealed himself. Uh, he revealed who he is. He revealed what he could do. And he revealed his plan that through Abraham, how many nations of the world would be blessed? All nations of the world would be blessed. Through this man and through the people and through his descendants, that God was at work doing something in the world. And he was engaging with his people. So he worked at establishing a people, and then he worked at establishing a nation. Who did he do that through? Moses. He establishes his nation through Moses, because up until that time, they were really just followers of the I Am. They were followers of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And after 400 years after Jacob's death, it's still a mystery about who that God is. And so we have God revealing himself to Moses. And he learns that he's the God who sees and the God who hears and the God who delivers. He's the God who leads. He's the God who provides. He's the God who demands of his people certain specific things. And so in this process, we started to consider the foundational principles for our lives. What's holding you up? Because God was establishing a nation and in doing that, he gave them the Ten Commandments, which we sort of know about, right? Some of us might be able to quote six or eight. I wasn't sure if I could get all ten, and by the time we're done this series, we should all be able to say all ten. I know Corey got her Sunday school class to know all ten, so my goal is at the end of this, we can all go first, second, third, fourth, work our way down through the Ten Commandments. And this is the reason why. We study the Word of God, to discover the ways of God. That's where we learn about him and to discern the will of God for my life. Like Jesse said, in taking a look at all of this, it's really still about how does this affect our daily living? And really for the 10 commandments, they were never really intended as um, our legislative way to come to God. That's how they began to function. And as they get elaborated, we'll see more about that but they were really to teach us what sin is because they were to a nation that had no idea how to function and how to behave outside of what they learned in the nation of Egypt when they were there as slaves. 
That's what they understood about how you treat people and things like that. And God will reveal himself. So we go into the word of God to figure out how to live our lives. And so God established a people. He established a nation. And then in Jesus, he is establishing his kingdom. And we have upon this rock, I will build my church. And the church is the, the outgrowth beyond a people, beyond a nation. There is the church, which is universal. It's not a particular nation. It's from every tribe and every tongue and every people. So the church moved this, God moved this even beyond the idea of a nation to become the church. And by the grace God has given me, Paul writes, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it, but each one should be careful how he builds for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And one of the distinctive, if not the distinctive feature about Christianity and the God of Abraham and the God who spoke through Moses is that now God spoke through the Son, his only begotten, God incarnate in the flesh. And so our foundation, the church foundation, is God in Jesus redeeming the world. God establishes a people, he establishes a nation, and he establishes a kingdom. So I said, we're gonna take a closer look at the 10 commandments. And we're gonna try and sort of wrap our heads around those as principles of life, but also to understand what God is asking of us. What was he mandating of the nation of Israel? And so I gave you a couple of passages to read. Anybody get them read? Oh man, I didn't bring enough Tim cards. So next week, you all get a chance. The goal is to read Exodus 21 through 26 again and Deuteronomy 5, 1 to 33. So that's the homework. And I will have Tim cards for the faithful, loyal readers. All righty, just a little hint. If you're big on prizes and awards and you need something extrinsic to motivate you, Tim cards are coming next week for all those who do their homework. Uh, it's in the budget. I've already put it in, Jess. It's okay. <laughs> so we've got this principle, and this is where we're going to park today. Um, Moses is trying to figure out who is this God, this God that spoke. Abraham was trying to figure that out. And I actually believe that since the foundations of the world, particularly Adam and Eve, the issue was, who are you? And are you God? And do you have authority? because the authority of God becomes the ultimate challenge for all of us. And so God is revealing himself to Moses and to Pharaoh and to the nation by saying, I am. They don't know who sent me or sent you, then tell them I am has sent you. And so then we have from Exodus 21, then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So this is after it's all taken place. This is when they're at Mount Horeb. This is when they're about to hear from God and he delivers this message. Remember where you came from because now you shall have no other gods before me. Some of the translations will use the phrase besides me or in my place. And so the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Pretty short, succinct, we can probably memorize that. You should be starting now, uh, but that's why you have the notes. You shall have no other God before me. The first commandment, the get-go. And so then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the oh, this is in Deuteronomy, right? Deuteronomos is how it's referred to in the Greek. Deutero to nomos law. And so we get our English word, Deuteronomy, second law. It's the recounting by Moses to the nation of Israel, all the things that happened, particularly related to how the nation would function. So it's the second law. So as Moses is now uh, speaking to the people, he's gonna give them a bit of a history lesson as well. Then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances which I am speaking today in your hearing, that you may learn them and observe them carefully. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb 
We entered into a relationship as a people to become a nation. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all those of us alive here today. And the Lord spoke to you face to face at the mountain from the midst of the fire. While I was standing between you and the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire. I'd have been afraid as well. We'd have been afraid and did not go up to the mountain. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. It's like, if you didn't get it the first time, you know how sometimes with your kids or with a spouse, you have to sort of go over it again and again. Lots of times now, Mary has to go over it again and again because I'm starting to lose some of my hearing. Or that's a convenient excuse. I'm not sure which yet. But, you know, you just need to hear it again and again. And so this is what happens in Deuteronomy. It's the second time. In fact, you've probably heard it a lot already, but I want to remind you again, this is the starter. This is the get-go. This is the foundation of it all. You shall have no other gods before me. And we're going to take a look, and that's why I've, I've handed out the notes, because I've got a lot of scriptures that address this theme. And one of the unique things is how they do that. So let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. These are words that Moses spoke to Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh had said, yeah, okay, go ahead. And then Moses reminds him, this is all about to take place so that what? You might know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The Egyptians had hundreds of gods. They had the gods of the sun, the god of death, the god of like all kinds of gods. And so the big question is, well, who's God? Who really is God? And so Moses tells him, you're about to find out. Um, in Exodus chapter 9, a little bit later, uh, for at this time, I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people. Why? That you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Do you see the exclusive feature that God is bringing to the nation of Israel? In uh, Psalm uh, 86, verse 8, uh, David writes this, Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. Um, you may remember the, um, the uh, priest, prophet Samuel. Um, when Samuel was born, it occurred because at that time his barren mom prayed that she would have a child. And she commits him to the Lord and says that he will be raised as your servant. And a couple of years later, after he's been weaned, he is brought to the temple and entrusted to the hands of Eli, the high priest of that time. But in her prayer, she says this, there is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. What I want us to pick up is lots of people along the way as we read through the Old Testament have the settledness about them that there is no other God. When David is told that he is going to be able to build or to gather all the materials to build the temple and to do all those things that will honor God, he says this in his prayer in 2 Samuel 7, 22. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There is no one like you. And there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. Solomon, after the dedication of the temple, will include in his prayers these words. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath, who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. All these different people, these significant leaders, and even like Hannah, just she's a handmaiden, really. A servant who made her life available for God's purposes. They all had this sense <coughs> that there is none other. In um, David's prayer in uh, First Chronicles, 
Uh, o Lord, there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. There is none like him. And that theme keeps being echoed. And Isaiah will also pick it up in the verses 8 and 9. Remember this, he reminds the nation. This is about six or 700 years after David. Remember this and be assured, recall it to mind, you transgressors, they were a nation in trouble. God was about to work in an active and intentional way to eliminate them as a nation because they had been faithless. Remember the former things long past? For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God is at work. And so beyond COVID and beyond all the things that we might see, beyond all the tragedy and the hardship, God says that he is at work. And then in Jeremiah, later on as another prophet, he will say these words, Lord, there is no one like you. You are great and your name is full of power. Have you picked up on the theme yet? There is none else, right? It's pretty clear at least throughout the scriptures. So here's my problem recently. Um, there is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet. So there's all, and there, uh, this is not um, a, an attack on any one. It just so happens that the, uh, the Muslim faith has some very clear statements about God. There are all kinds of other religious agencies as well. Conflicts and controversies among the indigenous among all of the other nations, as they try to figure out, is there a God? And so I was struck because this is one of those phrases that I've heard. There is only one God. Have you heard that before? That's what we say. There is only one God. So I started to do a bit of research uh, as much as I could, and this is just uh, off the surface. I'm after just the one theme. There is no deity except him, the ever-living, the sustainer of existence. That's just a quote from the Quran. It's a little bit further uh, in the Quran. Uh, he is Allah. There is no God but he, the knower of secrets and declarations. He is the compassionate, the merciful. He is Allah, besides whom there is no God, the sovereign, the holy, the peace giver, the faith giver, the overseer, the almighty, the omnipotent, the overwhelming, glory to Allah beyond what they associate. He is Allah the creator, the maker, the designer. His are the most beautiful names. Whatever is in heaven and on earth glorifies him. He is the majestic, the wise. It was helpful for me in looking at this because I've never really done much looking uh, at other major religious groups and some of the foundational tenets that they build on. And so I've, I found another quote, and this is, the, the printing is way too small, but the Arabic is there and it's translated. And so I've got a couple of different translations, just the same way as we've got a King James, we've got a New American Standard, a New Living Bible. Uh, he is Allah. There is no God except him, the King, the most holy, the all perfect, the source of serenity, the watcher of all things, the almighty, the supreme in might, the majestic, glorified as Allah, far above what they associate with him in worship and your God is one God there is no God but he most gracious most merciful uh, and then I found a quote from a uh, I'd always thought about Tolstoy as a, a, a Christian theologian but apparently in his life as things um, progress near the end of his life um, it seems that he will embrace uh, the Muslim faith Muhammad has always been standing higher than the Christianity. He does not consider God as a human being and never makes himself equal to God. Muslims worship nothing except God and Muhammad is his messenger. Uh, there is not any mystery and secret in it. And part of it was the struggle around the triune God or that God would express himself in different ways. And so here's what I wanted to hang on to today. Who's right? 
Remember how I said in the little post, some things are sometimes very difficult. Paul says in 1 Timothy, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Allah is not God, Buddha is not God, Muhammad is not God. There is only one God and his name is Jesus. He is the I am that I am. Um, when the apostles were being confronted by the Jewish faith, because the Jewish faith also didn't recognize uh, Jesus as God, or Jesus as the sacrifice for sin, um, they were confronted and, and sort of, okay, like, why are you doing this? And you need to stop doing this. You need to stop preaching about Jesus. You need to stop suggesting that there is another way to have intimate relationship with God than through the sacrificial system that we have followed since Moses. And so Paul will write as a, as a theologian, as a scholar, as a converted believer, and he says, or um, Peter will actually say, uh, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we, we must be saved. I was struck just maybe afresh by the challenge in our age. It's not a question about COVID, I don't think anymore. I think it's an issue of sovereignty in terms of who is God. And can I trust God? Is God, the God that we worship, big enough? Is he God? And so in conversations with people, I think now lots of times they'll stem from, well, first do you believe that there's a God? And what's he like? And are there lots of them, right? And somewhere along the way, in my own personal journey, I've settled that for me. I'm not going to be converting out of my belief that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he paid the price for our sin, that he is God incarnate. I, I, that one's settled for me. I know it's not settled for lots of other people. It's not settled for my kids. It's not settled for my grandkids. They're still trying to sort that through. But for me, it's settled. I just wonder about each of us. You know, way back in the Old Testament, Joshua was confronted because he's about to take over from Moses' leadership. And he is getting near the end of his book or the book about him. And he says this, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, he's going like, if this is a bad thing, serving the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, meaning the Jordan River, or the gods of the Amorites, the gods of the nations that they'd gone through, in whose lands ye dwell, because some of them decided to live on that side of the river. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I was struck also in this preparation by the three boys in the furnace. Remember that Bible incident? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they're in the furnace. Well, just before they head in, um, they have this comment to uh, the Babylonian king. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, I love that phrase. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Doesn't matter how bad it gets. I just want you to know, whatever happens, we will not bow. I will not conciliate. I will not give in. I will not give up the God who gave his life for me. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There is no other God before me. Jesus said, um, uh, or in 1 Kings, uh, Elijah is having the, the confrontation with the gods of Baal. And he asked them, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. 
But if Baal, well, then follow him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Have you made your choice about who you will follow? Have you made your choice about who God is? Have you made your choice about this first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. It's the, it's the one that struck me, and it, it starts off from there and starts to build. Because once we've settled on the fact that there is a God, and who that God is, and what he has done, that overflows into how that affects our life. Let's pray. Father, I, I, I pray that the, the thought of our, our, of our minds can be rekindled to foundational questions. This invitation to be a kingdom that's ruled by a sovereign King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That you are the head of the church, that we are servants therein, that you lead and you guide and you direct and you provide and, and you sustain. So Lord, we look to you to be our sustainer. We look to you to be the one that gives us life. And Father, we want to celebrate all the good things that have been happening within the, the life of so many in our church. Um, healings that have been taking place. We think of Blaine and now his recovery and potentially being home. That Addison has been able to find donors that are going to be able to help with bone marrow transplants and that that's going to start for him in November. And so, Lord, we, we're just so excited about how all of those things are happening for Herb's recovery and as we prayed for him and for the others, Father, for Ray and for Suzanne and for um, Wayne and Merv and Norma and others, Father, that are here with us. And we celebrate so much with Eob and his family and the sheer joy of them being here and having the next opportunities that the bondage that really exists in the refugee world, the, the sense of hopelessness that can be there. And Lord, may their life and the lives of all those others that have found their hope here in Canada, may they resolve to find their hope in Jesus, regardless of where we live, regardless of the circumstances of our lives. May we recognize that you are sovereign, that you are the one true God, and to you we give all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I picked a song for us. Um, we will recognize it. Uh, there is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. Let's stand, we'll sing this one, and then we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> None like you.